Watch this transformation. This is sped up thousands of times over a couple day process of a, of a butterfly coming out. Yes. Isn't it amazing? Even in the smallest, most minute creatures, like a caterpillar or a butterfly, the complexity and the, the transformative power, and even the smallest of God's creatures. When I was a little boy, my grandfather, we had a fairly large yard, and we had some banana trees back there backyard we had some uh, a little garden that grew kind of simple stuff green beans and carrots and we had some Japanese plum trees back there anybody hear about those those yellow fruits that make a really good jelly and, and every year we get this heavy manifestation of caterpillars that would come through and they would eat up everything literally just destroy the garden the trees they, they were all over everything everywhere and so my grandfather made a proposition with me and he said Michael, for every couple of caterpillars that you bring me, uh, I'll give you a penny. Now, I was a young, kind of industrious child. Uh, this was five, six, seven years old. I had the entrepreneurial spirit already, and I had my piggy bank. And I was very uh, consumed about putting money in that piggy bank. And so this was a sweet deal for me. I became a caterpillar hunter uh, extraordinaire. Uh, Steve Irwin didn't have anything on me. The crocodile hunter. Man, I was the caterpillar hunter. I was finding caterpillars under bushes and trees and grass. And I'd fill them all up in this bag. And I'd bring them to my grandfather. And he'd take a big bucket of water. And he'd pour the caterpillars in there and count each one. And for every couple caterpillars, I got a penny. Now those pennies, ladies and gentlemen, translate into quarters. And those quarters translated into dollars. And those dollars eventually became toys. <laughs> which all young boys are looking for, right? G.I. Joe's and Ninja Turtles and Star Wars figures. And so I became really consumed with this caterpillar hunting profession. And I figured out that here in Florida, we have these eastern tent caterpillars. And they live communally. And so they'll, they'll form these nests. Anybody ever seen those nests up in the tops of trees? They kind of look like a spider web. And there's literally hundreds of caterpillars that live in, in little communities and they go out into the trees and consume the vegetation, then they come back and live in those tents. So I had this idea, if I could get to those tents at just the right time, then I could get a hundred, couple hundred caterpillars in one shot. And so all I had to do was figure out how to get up there, how to bust those, those tents open, and here I, I hit the, the, the jackpot. So I was in the neighbor's yard, and back to tour neighbor's yard, and all over the neighborhood just collecting caterpillars. And I'm sure at some point my grandfather was kind of sorry he made that deal because I was starting to hurt his pocket book. But I made this realization maybe seven to eight years old uh, that it didn't really connect in my childlike mind that these little hairy little worms, these little pests, you know, you, you stomp on them, you squish them, and, and green stuff squirts out of them. Come on now. Y'all know they squish one in their life. Come on. That these same little hairy 
very little test where these same beautiful creatures of light with all the colors of the rainbow in their wings. And then when I made that realization, I realized that, man, I had slaughtered a lot of butterflies uh, trying to fill my piggy bank. And isn't it amazing, the transformative power, that metamorphosis. Can you imagine being a caterpillar all your life, walking on those little tiny legs, and then one day you become this creature of flight? And I also learned that this process that we just watched, of the, the, the caterpillar literally just hangs down, and they slough off their outer skin, and it becomes this cocoon. And this metamorphosis takes place. And fighting out of that cocoon, it's through the process of struggling out that they develop the wing strength and the dexterity to fly. And so if you disturb that process in any way or try to help the butterfly along, they'll just fall to the ground they won't be able to fly. But it's through the process of coming out of that cocoon that they become this different creature, this metamorphosis. You know, God has created all of humanity with that same transformative potential. We are made in the image of God, but marred and sinful, totally depraved. But through the transforming process of a relationship with Jesus Christ, in the infilling of His Holy Spirit, we literally are transformed. That's the heart of the gospel. Can I get an amen? amen. Transformation. Uh, the Bible tells us that anyone who is in Christ Jesus will be a new creature. That we will be transformed. Through that process, we become something else. And it's as if our whole life, we're kind of fighting free from the cocoon. So that when we cross through the curtain of death and when we step into eternity with our Creator, that we become something else entirely. The title to the message this morning is Open Hearts, Open Minds, Open Doors Equals Transformed Lives. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather in your word. And I just pray that our hearts would be alert and our minds would be receptive. That we would have ears to hear. And Father, that we would be called to a deeper level of discipleship in our walk with you. Uh, let us have no restraints. Let your word come alive and dance in us. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. And so I was looking out over the congregation last Sunday. And I saw all these people packed into the house of God. I saw uh, every race, every color, people from every culture. I saw people from every socioeconomic status. There were some people that were wearing suits and ties with tie clips and some lady that, ladies that had fancy hats with flowers and, and beautiful dresses. And then I saw other folks that were here with just a, a t-shirt and jeans. And we were all gathered together. I saw smiles on every face and we were worshiping God together. And I realized that I'm seeing a, a breakthrough moment. I'm seeing what the kingdom of heaven is going to look like. Did you know we're all going to be in the kingdom of heaven together? Can I get an amen? amen? So we should probably learn to love each other while we're here now before we get there. But then the afternoon service came along, and Miss Charles wanted to have that outside, and it was a beautiful day, a uh, nice cool wind and some sunshine going on, and there were 150 or 200 people that showed up for that. Of all denominations, many pastors showed up uh, of, of all different cultures, of all different races, and we gathered together under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. We laid aside our distinctions. We laid aside our differences. And we came together in the name of Jesus and by the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And this beautiful thing happened. This transformation of our congregation. This transfiguration. We, we literally became something else. It was like a breakthrough of God's kingdom spilling out into the earth. Can I get an amen on that? Could we agree that something significant happened last night? You see, everything that we've been praying for, those of you who've been faithful in the Pray for the Pew ministry, we've been praying that God would fill the pews and that He would fill the people that sit in the pews. Well, guess what? God answered our prayer last week. Not only was every pew filled, but there were chairs down the center aisle, chairs along the back aisle, people sitting out in the narthex. God didn't just answer our prayers. He answered it over and abundantly, pressed down and shaken over. Uh, God, literally, we became a people of an open door policy. We opened our doors to the community. We invited people in. We showed them the love of Christ. And they showed up, by the way. We became a people of open hearts. Open and receptive to the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, seeking the gifts of the Spirit. And that greatest gift of the Spirit, which is the gift of love. Which can bring two bitter racial rivals together. Like the Jews and the Samaritans. Or even Gators and Seminoles. <laughs> people were brought together by the love and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. 
we became a people of open hands. And we remembered our primary purpose was to lead people to the kingdom of God through the doorway of Jesus Christ. And we became a people of open minds, open to a different kind of preaching style, open to a different kind of worship, open to a different kind of music. And there was this time in the event when, when the children came up on the stage and they were dancing. And I looked out and everybody was singing and dancing and smiling. There was this contagious joy, this love that was all up over all the place. And we became a transformed, transfigured people. Can I get an amen? Amen. And this Sunday just so happens to be Transfiguration Sunday. Now, is that a coincidence or did God line that up? This Sunday we celebrate this holy festival, a feast day in the Catholic Church. That's Little C Catholic, the, the Church Universal. Uh, every Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, uh, Catholic celebrate this Holy Transfiguration Sunday uh, as a feast day. In the life of Jesus, in the life of His disciples, there was this transfiguring, transforming event that we celebrate uh, this morning. And so in the Gospel of Luke, in the ninth chapter beginning in the 28th verse, uh, we get a window into uh, the, the true glory of Jesus Christ. This transfiguring, transforming moment. Uh, when the disciples literally see him in all his glory. And in the 28th verse it says, Now about eight days after these things. Well, we can't just jump into the text without knowing after eight days after what? <coughs> well, if you backtrack just ten verses to the 18th verse in the Gospel of Luke in the ninth chapter. When Jesus was praying alone. Isn't it interesting that although Jesus was maybe the busiest guy in the world, right? He had three years from Nazareth to cross to change the entire universe and the condition of our souls. But Jesus always took time to go to a solitary place to pray. Probably important that we should pray. Amen? Amen. And he always took time, even for the marginalized and the downtrodden, and the folks that he was traveling around, these great throngs and crowds that uh, gathered around him, and, and the blind and the beggars and the people would cry out from the fringes of society. And Jesus would always take that time to touch the untouchable. And to love and bring grace and healing into the lives of those that needed it. Uh, so although he was a busy man, he was a man that kept about his father's business and kept priorities like prayer. And so he takes his disciples uh, into this time of private prayer. And he says to them, who do the crowds say that I am? And they say, well, you know, John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. Others say you're one of the ancient prophets that's risen again. And he says to them, but who do you say that I am? And that question, ladies and gentlemen, is the question that every soul that's lived since the cross is going to have to answer. How we answer that question has profound implications for the eternal destination of our soul. Because how we answer the question that who Jesus Christ is will determine where we spend our eternity. And so Jesus asks his disciples in this time of prayer and meditation, he says, who do you say that I am? And old Peter, old foot in the mouth Peter, always the first one to speak up, always the first guy to try to jump out of the boat and try to walk on water with Jesus, always got something to say, Peter. Anybody know any Peters in their life? Oh, yeah. uh, Peter says, you're the Messiah of God. You're the Mashiach, the anointed one. And, and while Peter's statement is, is correct, it's maybe not the total picture of who Jesus Christ actually is. Uh, he's on the right path. And in the other Gospels, uh, uh, Jesus says to Peter, you know, that, that statement is right, Peter, and your name's no longer Simon, but your name's going to now be Petros, Peter. And on this rock, on that confession, I'm going to build my church, and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. But then right after this significant moment, Jesus drops this bomb on his disciples. You know, following Jesus up to this point has been pretty fun, going around, casting out demons, being part of this movement, maybe even getting some recognition. And then he tells them this. See, the Son of Man must undergo great suffering, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And so the disciples, some of them are probably scratching their head at this point, going, okay, well that's not really our expectations of how the kingdom was going to come or how you were going to be the Messiah. In fact, they, they, didn't, they still don't get it all the way to the resurrection of who Jesus actually is and what his kingdom is. And, and then if that's not enough, they're saying, well, this is kind of a hard, hard saying here. Then he says, uh, uh, go a step further. If any of you want to become my followers, my disciples, then you will take up your cross daily and follow after me. You will take up your cross, your staros in the Greek, 
which was literally a symbol of punishment and execution, the basest symbol that you can imagine in the ancient world of torture and death. Jesus says, unless you be willing to deny yourself, take up that cross, and follow after me, then you are not worthy of my disciples. And then he talks about when he's going to come back in glory and how he's going to be ashamed of those that are ashamed of him. And then in the 27th verse, he says, but truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Truly, there's some of you right here, some of you disciples, that are not going to taste death until you see the coming of the kingdom of God and the glory and power. And then eight days after that statement, you see, eight days after Jesus says those words is a, is a minor fulfillment of those words when he takes uh, Peter, John, and James, which are his kind of key <coughs> inside guys, his go-to guys, and they go up onto the top of the mountain to do what? To pray. So within ten verses here, we've got uh, Jesus in two occasions uh, going to a solitary place to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothes became dazzling white. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of Luke's account. He kind of downplays it a little bit. Mark uses the word there, metamorphosis. There's this transformation that takes place in Jesus Christ that literally uh, this light is shining out of him. Not on him, but out of him. He is the light. And he's transfigured before them. And his, his robes become this dazzling, transparent kind of white. And the light is shining out of him. And it's as literally as if Jesus peels back his flesh. And for just a moment, the disciples are able to see Jesus in all His splendor and all His glory with unveiled faces. They behold the beauty and the power of Jesus Christ. Can I give an amen? amen? He shines and transfigures before them. And, and he, he, He's totally transformed. A metamorphosis takes place. And then suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to them. Now Moses and Elijah, they're Moses, symbolic of the law. And Elijah, who's symbolic of the prophets, standing beside Jesus. And we don't know, maybe Moses and Elijah had name tags on. Maybe Moses was holding the commandments and Elijah was standing on a chariot of fire. But probably the way that the disciples were able to discern who they were is they're having a conversation. And they appeared in glory. So this is not just simply Moses and Elijah. This is them in their resurrected state outside of space-time. Uh, here is Moses and Elijah standing there with Jesus in glory. And they're speaking of His departure. Well, what departure? The departure he just talked about 10 verses ago. That he's going to have to go to Jerusalem. He's going to suffer. He's going to be rejected. That he's going to be crucified. He's going to be raised on the third day, which we, he would accomplish at Jerusalem. And so now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep. These guys fall asleep at the worst kind of times. Anytime something significant is going on, they're falling asleep. But they come to uh, and become fully awake. Uh, and they see, just as they're leaving, Peter says to Jesus, uh, Master, it is good for us to be here. Now, is that not the understatement of the universe? Come on, Peter, that's the best you can come up with. Master, it's good that we should be here. This is cool that we're here. This is awesome. Uh, it's good that we should be here. He says, let us make three dwellings. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And that's a proclivity of the Jewish people. Anything, something significant happens, they want to build a monument. They want to throw up a tent or, or, or throw up some kind of, erect some kind of monument. Well, we do that in Christianity as well, don't we? When anytime something special happens, we want to build a church there. The church of the Holy Sepulchre, the church of Peter. And so Peter's kind of saying, let's freeze frame this moment. Let's stay right here. Let's, let's erect this monument of what we're witnessing right now. And Peter's ready to rock and roll. He's ready to start the kingdom right now. He's ready for this political entity uh, brought through Jesus Christ to come into being right here, right now. Let's throw up some tents and erect this thing. Let's get this party started. And then from a cloud, as Peter is in the middle of kind of saying these words, the, the, a cloud came and kind of overshadows them. And they're terrified as they enter the cloud. So when a cloud comes in the Old Testament, it's symbolic of the presence of God. They would kind of fall down on the mountain when he's speaking to Moses. And to kind of hide his, his true glory that, that anybody would really look on the face of God, it would destroy them and our mortal bodies. And so this, this cloud kind of falls not just over them, but kind of falls on them. And they're in the, the presence of God. They're in this, this thick cloud. And then from the cloud comes a voice that says, 
This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. It's almost as if God is saying, Peter, can you just be quiet for a minute? Can you take the cotton out of your ears and put it in your mouth for a minute? And here's Moses and Elijah standing beside Jesus, symbolic of the law and the prophets. And God is saying, this is my son. This is the chosen one. This is my divine son, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Listen to him, you see, because it's Jesus who fulfills the law. He signed, sealed, and delivered it with a language called love. It's Jesus who fulfilled all the prophetic voices that were ever spoken about it. It's Jesus the Christ who, who supersedes and fulfills the law and the prophets. And God is saying, of all, of all God could have said. Now, now, God doesn't just show up every day in the cloud and the voice, does he? Anybody ever been part of that? So this is a pretty special moment. But of all the nine words that God could have chosen to say, to speak to humanity, to speak to the disciples, this is what he says. This is my son, Jesus, my chosen one. Listen to him. And that's, that's our word as followers of Jesus Christ, that we should listen and obey the words of Jesus Christ. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent in those days and were told no one of the things that they saw. So this powerful moment happens in the life of the disciples this astonishing splendor, this transfiguration. Now you would think that that would be the kind of thing that would just change you forever, right? Man, I would never sin again if I could just witness that moment. I would just be transformed right there, right now. But the reality is that Peter, James, and John just went about life as normal. They went about making mistakes. Actually, just a couple of verses after that, they get into an argument about who's going to be the greatest in this new political empire. They go on as these flawed human beings. They come to arrest Jesus. They scatter. They run away. Peter even tries to take out a sword and take somebody's head off. A couple of that same night, he denies Jesus three times. So we can't freeze frame. We can't pause and just hang on to those moments of transfiguration and transformation. But we've got to follow the words of Jesus, which tells us to do what? To take up our cross daily and follow after him. And that's the life of faithfulness. That's the life of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. The everyday, dry, just humdrum, normal existence of taking up our cross on a daily basis and following Jesus Christ. John Wesley said, if you didn't take up your cross that day, you wasted that day. See, that transformative process is not an event. Yes, there's great moments of transfiguration. There's great moments of glory. There's great moments of transformation where we can literally see the kingdom of God breaking into the world. But we can't live in those moments forever. We've got to continue on pressing on towards the goal, continue on carrying the cross on a daily basis. And we've got to continue on in that process of transformation, which is the heart of the gospel. We've got to continue to be a people of open doors, seeking ways to open the doors to our community, to invite them in and show them the love of God. We've got to continue to be a people of open hearts that are open and receptive to the power of the Holy Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit. And that greatest gift that we just strive for above all, the gift of love. Can I get an amen? amen? We've got to continue to be a people of open hands, looking for ways to lead people to the doorway of eternity. We've got to continue to be a people of open minds, open to new strategies, open to God's movement in our lives. Because you know what? Change is coming, folks. It's in our backyard. And if we want to rise up, if we want to strive to be the church of Jesus Christ, and we want to rise up above change and be a breakthrough of God's kingdom into the world. Then we've got to be faithful, we've got to be obedient, and we've got to be open-minded to what God is already blessing among us and to what God is already doing in our community. Transformation is a process, not an event. We've got to live in that transformation. And just like a butterfly that's fighting free from the cocoon, developing the weak strength of our souls and the dexterity of our spirits, we are going through this transformative process, going on to perfection. That one day when we cross the veil, one way when we, when we step into eternity, that we will be totally transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. Having the mind of Christ in us, and that same love in us that He had. Growing every day more and more in love for God, in love for neighbor. Are y'all ready to be transformed? Amen. Are y'all seeking transfiguration in your lives? Are you looking for ways to bring the kingdom of God into this world right here, right now, until Jesus Christ returns triumphant? You see, the reality is, ladies and gentlemen, 
that open hearts, open minds, and open doors really does lead to transform lives. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word, which is a light to our path and shows us who we are and gives us the opportunity to not just be uh, hearers of the word, but to be doers as well. So Lord, we thank you for your anointing this morning and your spirit in this place. And we thank you for all the things that you're doing in our congregation. The 10, 11 youth that are going through confirmation and the people joining our family and the special ways we've been able to connect with our community and show people your love. And we just pray, Father, that you continue to do that. Holy Spirit, continue to move among us. And Lord Jesus, continue to conform us into your image not the image of the world. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And so now we gather together to have the most special time of service. Uh, this is not just uh, what we want to throw in or we want to add in at the end of the service. Uh, this is the highlight of the service. We get to gather at the table of Jesus Christ. We get to take a moment to, to seek our hearts, uh, to realize our sinful condition, and to have fellowship in the mystery of the Lord Jesus and His broken body and His poured out blood for us. So let's have a moment of silence as we just get centered and focused on our Lord Jesus. And if there's any hang-ups in your life or sin that you need to confess this morning, Lord, our Lord and Savior Jesus' mercy is new each day. So now we have the opportunity to come down and to leave those things that we all have to accept his sacrifice. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join your name in heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God, our heart, heaven and earth. So on that final night when Jesus gathered at the table with his disciples, he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body, broken for you, take me. And then he took the cup. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant shed for the forgiveness of sins. Take this and drink, all of you. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts of Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of the faith. Christ is died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. And if I could have the communion stewards come down at this time, 